As Washington, D.C.'s Central Library, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library serves D.C. residents from every neighborhood and culture in our city, with offerings ranging from maker's labs to town halls. Co-working to concerts, we go well beyond books. Here, artists and activists, teachers and learners, toddlers and singers converge to explore our city's past and the infinite potential of its future. Because the MLK Library is not only a place to be quiet, it is a place to be heard, to be understood. It is a place to explore the possibility of all we can be. And it is a place to just be. Welcome to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, celebrating 50 years as Washington, D.C.'s first memorial to Dr. King. So you all can hear me? Can you hear me? All right. Thank you again to the library, to the Library Foundation for having us. And to be part of the Institute for Racial Equity and Literacy, it's been a phenomenal week, and we're closing with an incredible panel. So I'm gonna start off with the author bios. First, we have Dr. Sonia Terry Paul. Can you come on up? Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul is the founder of Red Clay Educators. Her research and work stem from an unyielding commitment to anti-bias and anti-racism practices. She has taught middle school students for 20 years and developed curriculum that centers the work of racial literacy in K through 12 schools. As the co-founder of the Race Matters Committee in her former school district, Sonia spotlighted and centered issues related to race and racism and provided faculty and staff with the language and tools to facilitate conversations with students about race. That's why we're here, y'all. She adapted the number one New York Times bestseller, Stamp for Kids. Yeah, we should give that a round of applause. Which has earned star reviews from Kirkus, School Library Journal, and was selected as one of the best nonfiction informational books of 2021 by Parents Magazine, School Library Journal, the New York Public Library, and the Chicago Public Library. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Now we're going to invite Trisha Ibarbia to the stage. Come on up. <laughs> Trisha is the co-founder of Disrupt Tech. You make sure you Google that, put it in your Twitter if you tweet. And she's the co-founder and director of the Institute for Racial Equity and Literacy. Trisha advocates for literacy instruction rooted in equity and liberation through critical literacy. An educator with more than 20 years of classroom experience, she is currently the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Independent School in Philadelphia. Previously, Trisha taught and served as the department chairperson at the large public high school, at large, excuse me, where she taught courses in American literature, AP language, and AP literature. A National Writing Project teacher consultant, Trisha also serves on the board, uh, the advisory board for the Center for Anti-Racism Education. She is a recipient of the 2021 Divergent, excuse me, Award for Excellence in Literacy Advocacy, as well as the NCTE High School Teacher of Excellence Award. Trisha's work has been featured in various publications and academic journals, and she is the author of the forthcoming professional book on anti-bias literacy instruction. So again, a welcome. Thank you so much, Trisha. <laughs> We have two more authors joining us. Next, we have Frederick Joseph. Come on up, Frederick. <laughs> Frederick Joseph is an activist with over 10 years of marketing experience, and, and, and he's the New York Times bestselling author of The Back Friend and Patriarchy Blues, which just came out, right? Yes, it's the, his latest book as well as the forthcoming title, Better Than We Found It, and Wakanda Forever, The Courage to Dream. Mm. We got some books coming. <laughs> <laughs> An award-winning marketing professional and media representation advocate, Joseph has been recognized for the International Literacy Association's 2021 Children's Books and Young Adult Books Awards. He was named in 2029 in Forbes' 30 Under 30. And last but not least, Amina. Let me pull up your bio as well. Come on, Amina Lupin Dawson. <laughs> a 
Armina Lukeman Dawson loves using writing to tell stories and to build an understanding of race, culture, and community. Her published writing includes op-eds in newspapers such as the Washington Post, ma magazine articles, travel writing, and book reviews. She authors her, um, she authored America, excuse me, Images of America, African Americans of Petersburg, and she currently works as a policy professional, researcher, consultant on issues of education and criminal justice. She has a BA in political science from Vassar College and a master in public policy from UC Berkeley. Free Water is her debut novel, and it's so beautiful, and it's so beautiful. The novel has received critical acclaim, including five stars, reviews from Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Horn Books, School Library Connection, and Book Page. One more round of applause for all these amazing authors. So I did my due diligence because we gotta know the bios. We have to know all the incredible work each of these people have done. And we're talking about race and literacy. It's such an important subject. What I wanna kick off our conversation with is this one simple question. Maybe it's not so simple, but for each of you, when did you realize race existed? Can we start with you, Sonia? Sure. Um, I tell this story sometimes to educators, so it may sound familiar to some of the IREL participants if I've had conversations with, with you, but I can remember as far back as being four <clears throat> and understanding that uh, something about race really mattered. Um, and it was at that age where I started to notice television and commercials and I kept seeing shampoo commercials, and they were all a little bit different, but the one thing that was a constant is that there were always white women with long hair in these commercials. And even though I had this special uh, shampooing time with my mom on Saturday nights, during the week it was just a regular quick wash, wash up, but on Saturday nights we were getting ready for church, <laughs> so it was this special time with my mom to get my hair ready. I remember turning to her and saying, do, do we shampoo our hair? Because I didn't have the language at the time to name what I was experiencing, which was erasure, mm -hmm. by watching those commercials. And I also remember going to bed, and part of my prayers were that I would wake up white. Because mm. I wanted to be like the women in those commercials. So that's probably the first time that I realized something about race really mattered in, you know, in my life. Sure, I think, um, I can't remember a time where race didn't matter. I always knew that me and my family were different, you know, and, um, you know, my parents are immigrants from the Philippines. And I've never lived in a community where people who looked like us were in the majority, right? right? So I've never experienced that. Um, just briefly on trips to the Philippines. And I think when I was young, probably, you know, I can't remember it not mattering. I remember just knowing from a very early age that you know, we lived in a predominantly black neighborhood when we were younger. We moved to a predominantly white neighborhood. We were always on the outside um, and never quite fit in. So it was just always present in my life. Yeah. Uh, um, similarly, I, I think that I always understood that race existed. I think the context of what race does, right, um, was new to me. Uh, up until the time I was about seven years old, um, there was a, 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 a bodega. I'm from New York, obviously. Um, <laughs> there was a there was a bodega on the corner of my neighborhood. It was once owned um, by a Puerto Rican family, and I would go in there with a dollar. This is when like a dollar could actually get you something at the store. <laughs> um, and I would go in with my dollar, and I would get all these things. And I would walk around and just basically grab what I wanted and and put the dollar down um, and and leave. And I would I wouldn't even have to say anything. Um, and then one day I went to the store and it had new owners. The owners were um, Italian. And again, I'm about seven, eight years old. And I went in the store with this dollar, um, but the dollar was in my pocket. And um, I was grabbing the things I wanted 
And as I was walking, normally I would take the dollar out and put it on the table um, or on the, the, the counter. And as I was walking towards the counter, um, one of the owners grabbed my arm. You've been stealing, right? Um, and one thing led to another. Um, the dollar that I thought was in my pocket that I was going to put down, I, I, was, so, I was so afraid that I couldn't find the dollar. Um, so they wouldn't even let me search for it anymore. They actually called the police. Wow. And I'm about 78 years old. Um, the situation ended up getting resolved because the people from the neighborhood came by and was like, this is our neighborhood. He comes here all the time. You can't do this, so on and so forth. Um, but that was the first time I think my mother had to have a conversation with me um, finally about what it was, what it meant to be a young black boy. And that was also the same night that I learned who Emmett Till was. My mother had to teach me that as well. So that was my first time coming to terms with what race meant for me. I, I feel similar to you uh, in that I, I can't remember specifically when I, when I recognized race, perhaps always, but I do remember uh, when it felt like it mattered. Um, and I, I was raised in Los Angeles. Um, I was in a, what they now call South Central LA, but a predominantly black school in South Central LA. Um, where, you know, in those schools you have, you have good kids, bad kids, you got, you know, kids that do the homework, kids that don't. And of course, I was like, oh, I'm one of the good kids. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to do all my homework. <laughs> and, so, and, so I was, and so I left that school feeling like, you know, I was at the top of my class. And, and, I, and then they bust us to an integrated uh, junior high. And we got there in, in our really diverse neighborhood that was, you know, both kids from up the hill, down the hill, kids with money, with, it just, we just all became bus kids. And so we get to the school and it's so segregated that, um, and it's, it's integrated, but it's so segregated. It's a school within a school that mm. there are certain classes that I didn't even know existed. Like they didn't even tell us like the highest level classes existed. They just shut, put us on into the lower classes. And I remember my mom, advocated to get me into a higher, the higher class that they didn't even tell us about um, and, um, and that we found out about. And I get into the class and I remember the teacher looking at me and being like so disappointed. Like she's like, where are you coming from? Clearly I had like broken a rule. And, and, and she was, she despised me. And I didn't, to be honest, I, it, 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 I didn't quite understand that it was a race issue at all. I, I thought it was me. And so for me, I thought, mm -hmm. all I have to do is be perfect. And she's going to, like, I know how to do that. I'm going to work this out. We're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to dot every I, cross every T. <laughs> and, and you're going you're gonna to like me. <laughs> and, um, and it really took a moment for me to really understand. Like, no, she despised me. The better I did, the worse she liked me. Wow. <laughs> and the, the worse it became. Wow. And that was a real, and, and I've learned a couple things. One is that there was this personal interaction that you could have with someone who wouldn't like you just on the face, right. on the mm -hmm. face of it. Right. And two, that there were these schools that were completely, it was like a system, that understood what systems were. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just said suddenly that there was a place, an environment where everyone was the same, we were all the same kids that we had been before, but the system had just, it churned us and it yeah. treated us differently. And so that's when I, I saw, when, when we thought, I mean, at that same school, I had her and I had some of the best teachers in my life at that same school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they were the most segregated classes I'd ever been in. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the, I learned that race not only mattered personally, but as a system. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so incredible to he hear each one of you. Your stories are so distinctly different, but what stands out for me is they occurred in childhood. You know, so the moments that we experience as children, as young people, they follow us into adulthood and they really shape how we um, address race, influence our professional development. So each of you have incredible books and you work in the field of education in some capacity. How do you think those one moments have now impacted your, your professional trajectory? How does it show up in your books? I mean, clearly we have Sam. <laughs> you know, maybe we can start with you, Amina, and, and go back around. You know, it's it's interesting. There's there's not a time that my 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 book deals with the, the system of enslavement in this country, and it's specifically about children who escape enslavement and find themselves in a maroon community deep in the swamp. So that said, there's not a time when the when when the system how, my personal relationship with how I learned about the system of, of enslavement didn't impact me writing. I was always just sitting there in the back 
And what it does is, I remember back in the day, I don't know if you all remember this, but Roots used to be the, oh, yeah, uh, the miniseries, Roots. right? Back <laughs> in the, that was, no, I'm just saying, like, when you actually watched it, I watched it as a child when yeah. I was just yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, six. Um, mm -hmm. And my mom did what a lot of black folks, not, they wanted us to know this history, mm -hmm. and they knew it was important. They knew it was something that we needed to connect to, and she, because she understood it, not that almost everything, it, it is the root of the root, it is the bud of the bud that creates what we are today in this country. And so I remember watching it, and I remember feeling just extraordinarily just uh, taken aback, traumatized by how, how cruel um, enslaved people were being treated in it. And it frightened me to the point where I ran, I left the room and ran and stayed in the closet. Um, and, um, and each day it would come on, the miniseries, I would peek in, I wouldn't be so comfortable, and I would run back, and I would turn, and I would watch Gilligan's Island, which is terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was so ashamed of that years later. It's taken me years to admit this, and so <laughs> as this child, and so I go and I do that. So the point, but my point is, is that as I was writing this book, I knew that I wanted my son to have an experience that allowed him to one understand the realities of that pain that come with that system of enslavement but also, too, to be able to connect with the people that survived it. Mm -hmm. And that was so crucial to me. And so each day I wrote, I was always thinking, coaxing that girl out of the closet, like, come on, yes. come on now. You can, you can mm -hmm. come, talk to, come talk to these people. You, you need to know them. Because if you don't know them, if you don't spend time knowing the people who have been enslaved, then that is where the inhumanity starts. Yeah. And when you know them, that's where the humanity begins. And that's where you really can, that connection will matter more than anything. How you feel about that person matters more than all the details, the facts and the figures and all the, how many enslaved people were there, how many, no, that matters. Yeah. But what matters most is how you feel when you're in their presence. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the book's all about. It's about being in the presence of these children. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt that as I was reading your book, I was so inspired. Your story makes me think of, I remember first really learning about slavery to the point where I thought it, would, it couldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. I would like talk back to my like, teachers in elementary school and middle school and say like this is impossible like did this really happen you know like it just had me feeling so um because it just feels unfathomable like yeah. how could this be our like our system our, our reality but i love the fact that you're saying like to feel it to be able to have compassion for the enslaved people but also for yourself so yeah. you don't fall into anti um internalized hatred yes you know that is the um yeah. And so, and then maybe we can we can go to you, Sonia, because mm -hmm. you have done such an incredible job adapting a Ibram's work and mm -hmm. Jason's work and making it into even more digestible. I will be honest, I tried. I I did Ibram's book on audio, <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like when I was like reading your book, I'm like I understand it even more now. <laughs> I was like, this feels very digestible and accessible. How, how can you tell us about that feeling of creating this work? Because it's such a it's a yeah dense topic, but it's a very emotional yeah. one too. Yeah. Um, I think similar to what Amina is saying, you know, I think when you talk about the history of, of, of enslavement in the United States and you're trying to make this digestible for young readers, what we want is for them to see the humanity in black people and the humanity of all of us. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the way I thought about that was I was I'd been a classroom teacher for 20 years. I taught grades five, six, and seven, and I just imagined them coming in close, right? I think there's a different kind of energy as an educator when you're close to your kids. Mm -hmm. You start to talk to them differently. You start to watch them differently, and so um, I wanted that reflected in the book. The chapters are short, three or four pages so that kids can breathe and process. But what guided me through this adaptation was the lenses of affirmation and awareness, mm. right? As I'm telling this story, this, this true story of the history of, of racism in the United States, I wanted to make sure that kids were affirmed as they were reading this story, mm. right? Even as they're reading about anti-blackness, even as they are reading about these hard truths, where will they see um, themselves affirmed? And also we know that 
it's important that kids, we, we as educators, we help to raise their awareness. Mm -hmm. We help to raise their socio-political consciousness so that they can understand that racism is not simply isolated uh, incidents of hate, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, that it's endemic and that it's systemic because once they start to see it working as a system, then they can start to develop tools to disrupt it in their own sure. lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important work to be doing. And it's so important. I, another reason why I'm so excited to be here talking about this is we, the way that we treat children, like talking to them as humans, as individual beings, allowing them to like build their agency and have understanding, like they can comprehend this, mm -hmm. you know? And there's this kind of myth that happens like, oh, they're too young, yeah. you know? But all the experiences that you sh each of you shared happened to you when you were young. Mm -hmm. You were young people and mm -hmm. you were able to understand erasure. You were able to feel the pain of watching roots. Um, I now want to go to you, Trisha, because I am so obsessed with Disrupt Text. I like, again, if you are unfamiliar with it, go to Twitter, <laughs> hashtag Disrupt Text, T-E-X-T-S, mm -hmm. because we talk so much about diversity, diversity, right? We can have all the diverse books out there, but if you don't have the ability to understand critical analysis, mm -hmm. to really have understand media literacy, to go deep and, and build substance, that is so essential. Can you talk about how you made that core to your instruction and how you talk to, to young people? Sure, well first I wanna say that Disrupt Text is the work of a team. Yes, um, yeah. yes we have a team. Um, Dr. Kim Parker, Lorena Herman, and Julia Torres. Um, we came together actually over social media. Um, I don't even know how many years ago now because we were teachers who wanted to do this anti-racist work. We were all working in classrooms all across the country and we were feeling a bit isolated. Like you're the one teacher, the one teacher in your building who's trying to push against the grain. And we found each other. Yeah. And we came together and really thought about what does it mean to think about the intersection of anti-racism and literacy, yeah. right? Like there's anti-racism work and then there's the work of literacy. Mm -hmm. And how do we bring them together and what does it look like in a classroom? Because as Sonia was saying, you know, the classrooms can be radical spaces for right. kids. They can be places of erasure. They can be places of affirmation, right? Every time I talked with kids about meaningful experiences in their life, they had the same stories that we have. Mm -hmm. Childhood, yeah. middle school, the kindergarten teacher who refused to pronounce a student's name correctly. Right. I mean, I grew up with that because my maiden name is Bugga Muspud. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I remember dreading when there was a substitute teacher because I knew that that was going to happen, right? right? And so um, with Disrupt Text, we thought about what does it mean to create a framework for teachers. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, we actually have four principles, and one of the first ones is to always continuously interrogate our own biases right. as teachers. How are we showing up in the classroom? We don't do, and we've been doing such great work this week for our institute around that. Yeah. If we don't do that internal work, we might be showing up in ways that have an incredibly negative impact. Mm -hmm. Like I think about yeah. Amina, your teacher, I bet if we found that teacher today, they would have, they might have no idea that this is the way they were showing up. Or they might have an idea know, right? that that's she how they were showing up. <laughs> <laughs> or they might know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, that's true, yes. <laughs> Don't, sometimes it's intentional. Right. Okay. Um, so that's the first one. And then the second is to really amplify and center the voices of uh, people of color, yeah. right? When we think about, um, I don't have to look very hard to find stories, diverse stories about white people. Yeah. I don't have to look hard at all, yeah. but I have to look pretty hard and be intentional about finding diverse stories about people of color. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't until 2019 that I read a story with a protagonist that was Filipino American that had a very close mirror to my own. And that was wow. Randy Rebuy's mm -hmm. Patron Scenes of Nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in my 40s. Wow. So I just, we really want to think about how, I shouldn't have to look that hard. Mm -hmm. And then we also think about that critical lens, right? How do we read text? Today we were talking about how we read race in text. Yeah how we racialize characters in text, even when we're not even thinking about it. Right. It just happens automatically through racial codes, yeah. right? What does that mean? Right. 
And where is it happening, not just in the books that we're teaching, but also in all the media that we're consuming? And then finally, our last principle is really to do what we've done on our team, which is to work in community. Yeah. Right? You have to have thought partners. You have to have accountability yeah. partners. You have to have people who will love you and tell you when you're wrong right. mm -hmm. or ask you to think about things differently. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. I have a habit um, when I'm reading books, when I was reading each one of your books, I circle words that I want to think about or ponder. And uh, so I'm trying to think of the words that came to mind. Um, one of the main ones, and you just said it, Trisha, was interrogate. And I thought of that so much when I was reading your book, Frederick. In both of your books, you do this wonderful self-interrogation where you're asking questions to the reader and to the audience, but it definitely is a thoughtful approach to the self. Uh, can you talk about um, that experience for you, interrogating racism, interrogating yourself, and being able to put that in a book and share it? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I think that one of the pitfalls um, of not just anti-racism, but anti-patriarchy, um, anti-capitalism, um, anti-anything work is that it lacks oftentimes the understanding that we too who are marginalized in it and are in also indoctrinated in it, right? So right. one of the things I wanted to do in The Black Friend was not just you know point my finger and wag my finger, but talk about the ways in which anti-blackness had in, at times made me anti-black, right? Right, Because, and, and in the same thing, patriarchy blues, which I think is still obviously a little different um, in that obviously I'm a cis um, het man, but um, patriarchy blues, I wanted to focus on how we're all implicated in upholding the patriarchy, right? right. Because when we think of something like patriarchy, oftentimes um, that concept is owned um, in the minds of the mainstream media by white feminism. Um, and when you have that, uh, it's a very narrow lens as to what patriarchy is. So I wanted to talk about how it is also mm -hmm. um, transphobia, how it is also homophobia, how it is also toxic masculinity, how it is also white supremacy. Yeah. Um, so both books really do exist in that space of me trying to say we're all a part of this. Yeah. Um, and then I think back to some of the things that all of you were saying mm -hmm. um, and, and just education and, and I think that I would even take it a step further in terms of the classroom. I think the classroom has to be a radical space for it yeah. to do any work necessary. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, when I think about, uh, you know, Stamped, when I think about um, uh, All Boys Aren't Blue, and when I think about all these books, yeah. I think that the, it's necessary for classrooms to be radical, especially in this moment, yeah. maybe more than ever before. Right. Um, because if not, you'll have what happened to me ultimately where my, ho my humanity was diluted for a long time because mm. of the classroom, right? I, I had a similar instance to you where um, I had educators who, because I was a young black boy, mm. they made me hate myself. And that started yeah. in the classroom. And there's no amount of work that my grandmother and my mother could do right. to undo what's happening from these white adults that I'm with more often than I'm with my own people. Right. Right. Um, right. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I didn't write my first book until I was in my late 20s, because mm -hmm. I didn't think that I could write a book, yeah. right? I literally didn't think I could write a book because I was told that it wasn't a part of me that was possible right. by white institutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I think that we have to do that work of interrogating every single aspect, how we all fit in. Yeah. I don't care if you are uh, white, black, Asian, so on and so forth. We all are implicated right. in these right. in these institutions, and we all have to unlearn these institutions in every way possible. So I'm trying to do that in my books. Yeah. Does anyone else have any uh, feedback on the word interrogation and how you approach it when you're working with educators or even when you're writing? I'm, I'm curious, I'm looking at you, Sonia, because I, I really <laughs> want to, because I feel like you have such a really precise way of looking at the world and how you talk to educators and share your mission. Yeah, I mean, similar to what so many are saying here, I think the curriculum is our most radical tool. Mm -hmm. So what I'm always trying to do is to help educators to think uh, very deeply about that curriculum what are the explicit mm -hmm. things that we're teaching children, what's implicit yeah. in that curriculum, to, to really kind of tease it apart. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get caught as educators in doing things simply because it's the way we were taught. Yeah. And then we start to replicate these patterns. Um, 
that are problematic yeah. and making kids feel less welcome in their space, making mm -hmm. kids feel like they have to check their identities at the door, and we know which kids have to check which identities at the door, right. and sort of cross over into the threshold as this neutral being, yeah. which is um, harmful and yeah. dangerous, right? And so I think a lot of the work we were doing this week with um, the Institute is to really help educators understand that we bring our identities, all of them, our racial identities, our cultural identities, language, mm -hmm. linguistic identities, um, with us mm -hmm. to every single experience. Yes. And, um, and as a reader, I'm going to read that text as a black woman, right. as a black woman who's a mother and a partner and a teacher. And, and these are strengths, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm going to uh, interrogate that character and interrogate myself with those identities, and we should welcome that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And just imagine how rich um, the kind of work kids would do would be mm -hmm. if they felt that their classrooms were identity-inspiring spaces. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the interrogation we need to do as educators is to think about, you know, is the work identity silencing mm -hmm. that we are doing with our kids, or is it identity-inspiring, and yeah. what are the different ways? I yeah. love that. Go ahead, Amina. I, I feel you, you doing know, that. I, I appreciate this word interrogation mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as, as an author. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. My, the Free Water has several characters, all sorts of characters, that uh, dis different aspects of mm -hmm. both children who had been enslaved and were now free, and then children who had been born, who were born in this maroon community away from enslavement and had never known, had never known slavery. Uh, and then, but there's this one child. Um, who is, um, he is the daughter of, her name is Nora, she is the daughter of the owner of the plantation. Mm -hmm. And she's the one white, white, white protagonist child. And so I'm writing, each of the chapters is assigned mm -hmm. to a different child. And so I'm, as I was writing each chapter, let's say, especially now Sanzi, who is a child who has never known enslavement, mm -hmm. she has only lived in this maroon community. I noticed as I was writing for her, versus writing for Nora, the white child of, of the enslaved, of, of the master of this plantation, it was harder to write for Sanzi. And mm -hmm. I said, well, why is this? You know, when mm -hmm. I started, I said, like, why? How, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. Why do I get this sort of lyricism when it comes up to Nora? I'm like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and all it did, and, it, and, and I stopped myself. Yeah. And one, it's because it's, it's just this built-in bias. And I yeah. had you know, it's a bias I had in my own self. Yeah. I was yeah. like, well, I was raised on uh, Louisa May Alcott, I was raised on Lois Duncan, I was raised on uh, so many uh, great uh, but white um, authors and yeah. in, in, in their stories that inside me somewhere it's all pro it's there it's all sitting there yeah. and, it, and it's easy to dig that up but where had I ever seen a child that was born in a maroon community right I had never seen her right. I had to create her in my mind I had to learn her I had to know her I had to get to know her and that was in interrogating myself yeah. in that process and seeing that it, 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 it took me about I was taken aback yeah. and I, but I learned about myself as well I'm like yeah. wow look at look at that look at that bias yeah. you know and it's just bias based on how I've been educated in the system right oh my goodness so. yeah. and e that process of unlearning right yes. and being okay with that saying like this is a thing that I internalized that I didn't have a full understanding of yes. and I, I but you can unlearn it and yes. I think that's like the the most powerful thing of all these experiences that as adults um, we can unlearn the things that we we can create new traditions new mm -hmm. practices we can write new books that mm -hmm. correct the narrative um, you talked about identity and I want to talk about parenthood because mm -hmm. educators yes but we also have parents in the audience mm -hmm. how does parenthood affect the way you write and is it something that is really top of mind when you're writing and creating curriculum um, and how does it shape what's possible for the future? Yeah. Um, so I'll just take it first because I'm not a parent. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. my, my, my wife and I, we're in the process of trying to become parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that in that process, um, we've had to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. what are we doing um, to, to make this a world that we want to bring children into? Yeah. Um, especially, especially knowing um, that we're going to bring a black child into the world, yeah. right? Um, who's going to sit at the intersection of 
um, white supremacy, the intersection of capitalism, um, climate disasters, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think that as an author, th I've had to let that be the embodiment of my pen when yeah. I sit down, mm -hmm. right? I like even in, in the work that I'm working on right now that's fiction work, mm -hmm. I would be doing myself and my future children a disservice mm -hmm. by not letting my my skill, my gift for writing, mm -hmm. um, sing songs that are true of the yeah. moment and moments that we are going to be in. Right, um, right. So I, I think that as educators and as parents and, and whatever, anyone, because I, I also think of parents um, sometimes as you know the people that kids interact with right it's the yeah. it's, it's the principal it's the, it's the teacher in the classroom it's the, it's the lunch lady it's the it's the bus driver yeah, it's right the coaches, right it's yeah, it, yeah exactly it, because yeah. I do think that parenthood um, is supposed to be a village yeah. right and I think we've gotten away from that and that's part of the reason why we are where we are because we've become so um, narcissistic almost in our views yeah. of, of of how people grow right or so singular yeah yeah, yeah. so yes so individualized yeah. um, and it is very much supposed to be all of us together as a collective and when we start thinking like that we start imagining like that I don't have to necessarily be a parent yet because yeah. if if I, I already know if, if you have somebody running around I'm like hey look Trisha your kid running around here you can't bug it I'm about to grab him up you know <laughs> and, and that's what we need to get back to in my opinion yeah. so I try to embody that in my work yeah yeah that's amazing mm -hmm. Trisha do you have anything to add um, since Frederick keeps calling us. <laughs> yeah, I already, I I already called Trisha up. Do. <laughs> Please do. If you see my kid up, up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things that I think about a lot as a parent is one, I try not to project my experiences on my kids. Mm -hmm. I have three children, yeah. 17, 11 to 17. And um, yeah, it's that stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I think about not projecting my experiences on them and allowing them the distance and the respect and the independence to really figure things out on their own. And yet in the back of my head, I'm always thinking, how are they doing? Like, what, do, how, what messages about racism are they internalizing? I'm like asking the questions about what they're learning in school. And then yeah. there's that other uh, supplementary education that has to happen at home. Yeah. So, you know, well, what did your teacher tell you about, you know, this event in history? Mm -hmm. And then it's me at home. Well, did you know? And then like, I'm, and they know, they know what's coming. Like, okay, <laughs> tell me the other side of it. Did you know? And we, I mean, and it's everywhere. It's not yeah. just in school. It's also with television that we watch. Yeah. It's everything. Did you notice how that character? Yes, mom. We noticed. Oh my God! That yeah. was like you, Trisha. <laughs> like, do you know why we're watching this? And like, yes. Do Do you want to watch that because it has this? I'm like, yes, that is right. And we're going to the movies because we got to support these movies. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's 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 that supplementary education as a parent that we always have to do to think about how to make up for the harm that white institutions often inflict. Yeah. My son, I'm, I'm a new parent, it's, but I, I love it because it's so much fun to like embrace that and ask mm -hmm. the questions. And I feel like I'm like re-educating myself so I can translate it to him. I mean, granny, he's two, so he doesn't really <laughs> understand. I'm like the boys. He's like Elmo, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. But th that experience is just so edifying, and I, I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I. My book is dedicated to my son, um, and, and interestingly, so his name is Zach, and so it's to Zach, and it's to all the enslaved children who had who d who are deserving of a voice, all of whom are deserving of a voice in this world. And I think that that totally that that the two are there is totally on purpose, um, mm -hmm. because part of what brought me to write the book was for him, yeah. I mean, and in a very practical way too. I mean, mm -hmm. my husband and I were, we were, we, we knew fourth grade was coming and in Virginia, that is when you learn American history, that's mm -hmm. when you learn about indigenous peoples, that's when you learn about enslavement, mm -hmm. the system in this country. And so I'm like, I wonder if I could get a book done <laughs> before he is fourth grade. <laughs> uh, uh, no, <laughs> he's, he's 14 now. Um, <laughs> Miss that, um, but um, but I was I constantly thought of him because let's say when I did start writing, I noticed the kinds of stories he liked. He was into Harry Potter. He liked he liked uh, Rick Riordan type things. Later, he liked big, complex, and very sort of involved stories. And 
and I wanted something equally so, something that could meet that bar. I'm yeah. like, I, why is this? Why does you know dealing with African American history have to be in this sort of flat? Well, well, this is who Frederick Douglass is, and this is right. Who, no, that's fine. That's all good. We should all know who Frederick Douglass is, <laughs> right? Okay, right. <laughs> but I also knew that the stories that moved me and the stories that were moving him. They, they, they stayed with him because he was attached to those characters. Yes. He was attached to that story. Yep. I mean, to this day, I, I, I read Anne of Green Gables as a child, and to this day, if you mention the name Anne Shirley, I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 I mean, just because that story, that protagonist mm -hmm. was so cool to me and so interesting, and I have no cultural connection to her, I have no, there's nothing about us that's in common, doesn't matter. Yeah. because the story made me have compassion and, and caring about that character. Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey, can mm -hmm. we not do that when it mm -hmm. comes to dealing with people who have been enslaved? Yeah. Can we not create a space where they want so much to connect with that character, they, they connect in such a way, they will never forget that character. That's yeah. That character and how they feel about that character stays mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. And, I, and I, know, I know that because fiction has done that for me. And so yeah, for him, that was the bar in, in parenthood. It, I mean, in a very practical way. I mean, it's set up in a way the book is very short chapters. I'm like, you, yeah, there you, go. <laughs> you know, the kids like that. That's great. It sort of moves along. It's very, it has a lot of, you know, a lot of action in yeah. it. Um, but it's all with the purpose of can we connect in a more visceral way yes. with the humanity of these people? Mm -hmm. And then that is what's going to take them through life, mm -hmm. not so much the facts and figures of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to have you sign my books to my son, and I'm going to read it. I'm like, I already have so many plans of reading so many books to him. He's going to be like, Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> 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 no, I'm like, I'm what? Elma. Um, we are now going to open the questions up to the audience. I know folks, we have questions here. So Miss Chanel is going to be walking around with a microphone if you have a question for anyone on the panel. even gonna let me hold it that's great hello everyone hello. Um, I have a question my particular question it's a statement first and then a question but around the age of 14 I started to hate literature mm. and it was ninth grade I'm reading Diary of, An Diary of Anne Frank Moby Dick Shakespeare stuff I probably should love but I hate it mm -hmm. and at a certain point I started to not like reading mm -hmm. And then maybe about 18, somebody put Malcolm X in my hand mm -hmm. right. and something happened to my brain again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to buy every book I could ever buy and read again. Uh -huh. So with that as a backdrop, I want to ask two questions. One is, from a standpoint of an author, what do you see the pathways to creating that transformation in children? And really from the standpoint of like schools, Curriculums being bought, mm -hmm. uh, purchasing agents, distribution centers, and then the the machine, you know, the the machine who's like colonized mm -hmm. literature and mm -hmm. what can get in the schools, etc. What's the pathway forward? Thank you. I have like a small. I will like leave this for the panelists, but I think um, with my work with Well Read Black Girl, I have really tried to think about pleasure reading as mm -hmm. a way to as like students picking their books and be having agency, like what a, whether it's a comic book or you are gravitate towards Malcolm X, like actually putting that somehow within into the system of like you get to choose, mm -hmm. you know, like and it doesn't matter what you choose as long as it's something that you feel excited and enthusiastic about. So I've seen that in, in my work, but I would love to hear from the experts. Yeah. Well, similar to you, I was 18 when I read Autobiography of, of Malcolm X for the first time and I remember walking around campus reading it running into trees and just <laughs> you know stumbling yeah. right like oh my gosh where was this book but i think that that says a lot right mm -hmm. that it took until 18 mm -hmm. that i was able to have access to right. that book mm -hmm. so i think that is part of the the problem um my daughter is much older than your children um and i i remember her being young and going to the library and and just pulling books off the shelf that had characters that looked like her mm -hmm. and taking them home and spreading them out on the floor and letting her pick which one she wanted to read. Mm -hmm. 
um, because you know when I went to school, the first book I read that had ca black characters was Roll of Thunder. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the only book in elementary school mm. that had characters that looked like me. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to now, um, we still see this lack of representation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, data on children's literature shows that still books. Um, the predominant uh, amount of books are being written about white characters mm -hmm. by white authors. Mm -hmm. And the next highest character, a uh, 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 percentage of books are about animals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then everybody else combined mm -hmm. is the, the percentage of all the other groups of people, so mm -hmm. black, Asian American, native, Latinx, mm -hmm. combined is smaller than the group of animals, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So while we would like to think that, you know, it's a lot easier, um, access continues to be challenging for kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that matters, right? That mm -hmm. matters. And also it's important for teachers to, um, to be aware of what they do with those books, right? Yeah. So a lot of teachers get caught up in consumption Right. Yeah, they've got true. the latest insert any yeah. author's books, right? And they're getting all these books and they're excited about it. And yes, buy all the books. Buy all the books by black authors, by Latinx authors, by Asian American Pacific Island authors, by native authors, by all the books. But mm -hmm. what are you doing with those books that will make a child feel like they can connect with them? Right. That's important. They can't just sit on the, the shelves um, or sit in the baskets for consumption purposes to decorate your rooms. How are you um, doing book talks with kids? Mm -hmm. How are you making those books central in book clubs? How are you, you know, replacing maybe some of those canon texts with, you know, contemporary texts that are going to get kids really excited about reading? Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was doing um, a, a talk recently at a school, and I, I was talking about my first book, The Black Friend, and um, the classroom I was in, um, she's a friend. Uh, she had just read my upcoming book, with, which is co-authored with my wife, um, Better Than We Found It. And, you know, the kids are excited, and we read parts of it, we're excited. And this one kid is just like, I don't care. Right. So, so, but, but, but that's the kid I'm really. Uh, that's, that's the kid I'm always interested in, right? Like, he's like, he's like, yeah, I don't. Uh, he's like, I don't care. And you know, I, I asked him after. I was like, "Oh, well, what's going on? Why don't you care about the, about, about the books?" He's like, "Why do the white kids get to read about all sorts of things pertaining to the world around them, but the black kids always have to be learning something? Every book about us is somebody has to learn something, yeah, right?" right? Mm -hmm. And and I and I thought about that for a long time. That was actually why I started working on the novel that I've been working yeah. on, um, because I was like, "He's right, right?" I think yeah. that what we've done, especially in the last few years is while there are m more books by people of color, mm -hmm. a lot of them are in service of white people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need a renaissance also to the point of reading Malcolm, right? We need, mm -hmm. we need more of that, right? Because I remember my first time picking up a book um, ever and, and, and being like, oh my God, it was Beloved, yeah. right? The yeah. first book I ever read by a black person was Beloved and I was 19, yeah. right? Think about how, how how horrible that is. I thought that F. Scott Fitzgerald was the best author that ever existed until I was 19 years old. Yeah. Like, you know how wrong that is? You know, like, you know how unfair that is, right? So to your point, that makes perfect yeah. sense because I, I want to, and I don't want it to just be the books that are anti-racist or anti-patriarchal. Yeah. I want to read Love and Basketball on the page. I want to yes. read. I want to read Love yeah. Jones on the page. Yes. I want to read The Wood on the page. Right. right? right. Wait and exhale. And that's what right. I think we need to also be striving, striving for yeah. across the board. And that's how we change the game. Yeah. We have any more questions from the audience? This brother right there with glasses. <laughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, so, just a question about. I was invited by uh, Aja Clark here. This was awesome. I didn't expect this at all. <laughs> so, <coughs> just to be among ed educators, I was a teacher for about ten years in New York City. Shout out to New York City. Hey. <laughs> you know, so. In it we in here. <laughs> <laughs> and no 
matter what you do, if, you're, if you've ever been a teacher, you carry that with you in whatever, you know, yeah. post-pandemic transitional career you go into. Like you're always looking at it th as mm -hmm. a, through the lens of a teacher. I'm, at, I'm trying to ask, is anybody, is anybody up there having experience as a teacher? And when you speak about uh, this interrogation, which is, which is awesome, I love this word, I'm taking this word out with me. How, I'm thinking of core teacher training, right? As I, mm -hmm. When I was a teacher, one of my mentors said, teaching is subversive activity, right? I'll mm -hmm. never forget that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Booker T. Coleman in the Bronx, teaching is subversive. Mm -hmm. How many teachers do you think really look at teaching as uh, in interrogating, right? Mm -hmm. Want to create that space where kids question inside mm -hmm. the room, or do they just kind of, you know, and how do you grab, because this is a national effort here. Each state has its own, you know, how the system works. Each state has its own, you know, curriculum right. to try and connect, c connect it, because we are a country, to try and bring people together. How, how do you see that playing out on the stage of grabbing teachers in the beginning to start to think about that interrogation? I know it's a lot. Yeah. I wrote down some questions, but that's what came to my, my head, so thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the work that Trisha and I are passionate about. That's the work that we try to do. Um, every day with educators to really work with them to become intellectual activists who that part. are, you know, coming into their classrooms and doing the kind of things that, that you're doing. It's not easy, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are teachers who are really, I think one of the things that gives me hope is that there are, even in this moment of, of great resistance in the nation, um, we're busier than we've ever been, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We are getting calls from teachers and schools who, are, who really want to commit to doing this work. Mm -hmm. There are teachers here at MLK, at our institute, mm -hmm. for a week in July. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they could be anywhere, yeah. right? They could be on yeah. a beach, yeah. giving yourself yeah. a round of applause. They could be with their families. They are here from the morning to the afternoon mm -hmm. every single day. You don't hear these stories in the news. Um, so mm. there are educators who really are committed to doing the work, who want to do the work, mm. and, um, and I think you, you, we should all know that, and we should acknowledge that, celebrate it, and um, in terms of changing the field of education, that's, that's harder, right? Mm. Working with, with leaders and yeah. getting them to lead this work in their buildings, um, it's challenging. Mm. It's challenging. I don't know. Do you want to? I think one place that the work can really happen is pre-service teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think there's so much, you know, that we can do mm -hmm. to capture teachers before they actually even go out into the field mm -hmm. and to really think about what is the work of teaching. Mm -hmm. I've always thought it was fascinating that, um, you know, when I was a graduate student, I had to write this philosophy of teaching, mm -hmm. right? And I was, having never stepped in the classroom, I was brilliant. And, um, <laughs> and um, but then I've never been asked to do it again, right? <laughs> and, then I, and then I walked into my classroom and into a predominantly white school. I was the only teacher of color in my department wow. and, or one of the only in school, in fact. And I assimilated right back into the patterns that I had been um, socialized into when I was a student. Wow. And, and this was even after going through my own like sort of awakening around anti-racism when I was in college and doing all this work around it. And then the minute I went back, the patterns just took hold. And I had to like, whoa, that was, those patterns run deep. And mm -hmm. I had to think about what that meant. And I think teachers really need to think about, are you here for liberation? Are you here for assimilation? Like, what is your purpose? Right. Right, to really ask that really hard question about mm -hmm. what your work is for. And honestly, like Sonia says, I think there are amazing teachers who are willing to commit a week in the summer mm -hmm. during a pandemic to do this work. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think there are a lot of teachers who are more of the assimilationist model, yeah. mm -hmm. including some teachers. That's how I was as a, you know, my first year's teaching. I had to unlearn all of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's hard work, and we need leaders yeah. at all levels to be invested in it. Yeah. And I think your point about pre-education programs is, is something to, for, for folks in communities, whether you are a parent or not, you live in a community where there's a school, yeah. and there will be teachers who will be coming to work at that school. Um, and many pre-education programs, you can go through that program 
and never take a class mm. on uh, racial literacy or wow. right you can opt in to that or decide not to mm. and so when you are in that community and you become active mm -hmm. on these various committees in your community mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and you get onto the hiring committee, you can start asking teachers different kinds of questions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What does it mean to you to be anti-racist, right? And yeah. watch the reaction, right? Yeah. And then talk to the people who are in leadership positions and letting them know what's important to you in this yeah. community. And all of us can do that work, whether you're a parent or not, mm -hmm. whether you're a caregiver or not. Mm -hmm. Sonia's giving us the keys. Join PTA hiring <laughs> committee. <laughs> and there's enough of y'all to fan out. Some of you can go to the board meeting. Some of y'all can go to the PTS me A meeting. Yeah. Like fan out. Superintendent. Yes. All the things. Um, do we have any more questions before I go to our closing mm. question? All right, we're going to the closing question. So, um, Okay, during this time, we've talked about just how tasking this work can be, how emotional it can be, um, but also it can be so edifying, it can bring us such joy. I just really wanna know what brings you hope and what allows you to continue to do this work with such vigor and just so much passion. I'm gonna say the kids. The kids give me hope. The kids have always been poised and ready to lead the revolution. Yeah. Um, we see them doing it in response to all of the book banning mm -hmm. nonsense, the anti-truth policies and laws. Yeah. Kids are rising up and organizing. I'm gonna go with the kids. That's what gives me hope. The kids are all right. Mm -hmm. How about you, Trisha? Um, I will also say the kids, <laughs> but I will also say my own children specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Because and I think about this idea of how do we leave, how do we make the world a little bit better for them? Mm -hmm. And how can I help them? Mm -hmm. And how can I equip them with the tools that they'll need to make the world a little bit better? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, you, you both said the kids. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm going to lean into kind of my theory of change for the world. Uh, I'm going to say uh, black trans women. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say black trans women because when I, when I think about all of our struggles collectively, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm in space, I'm in community with black trans women, the most oppressed group in the world, not, not in this nation, in, in literally in the world, yeah. and can still see the joy right. in yeah. these spaces and in the community, I'm, that gives me hope to keep going because I know that it's there. Mm. Uh, well, I'm gonna say the books. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, and, uh, and the kids, and the kids, um, <laughs> love the babies. Um, but um, the the, I just think that I, I was buzzing through Sam for kids last night. I'm just like, oh gosh, it's so good. I wish that I had had something yeah. like this when I was a kid. I mean, how differently might I have? just process things. What yeah. if I had had that before I walked into that class in junior high, you right. know? Um, and might I have seen things better, you know, yeah. known things better. And so so the books uh, helped me a lot. And, and I know right now we are in a tough place with book banning and this movement that's coming, um, but there's a reason why it's there. It's because there is change coming mm -hmm. as well. Right. And so that is the hope for me, and it's that um, you all are here. It's that um, mm. we keep finding that there are parents out there, there are kids out there, there are we are out there who mm. want and are making change. Yeah. And the threat of that change is what's created this this pushback. Yeah. And so you know we have the 1619 project. Hello, I mean, you cannot if you can't undo that. Right. I mean, I guess they can try, but no, you <laughs> cannot undo that. Um, and so it is there. Um, and so all of that to me says there is hope even in, it as it, there, there, there would, there's a reason why we're here. There's a reason why there's a battle. Uh, and that means there is another side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, this has been so incredible. I could talk to you guys forever. Yes, are really fortunate to have, we're gonna be doing a book signing. We have free books for folks that are interested and we're gonna have everyone's book is available. We have stamps, we have free water, we have Patriarchy Blues and The Black Friends. 
So we're going to be signing after. So please stay, get your book signed, talk to each other, network, high five, do all the things. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, Glory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.